pretty one, Ulysses. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I have such exciting news. <laughs> it's so exciting in my little brain, to my little mind, that uh, I found out about it at about 3 o'clock this morning when I woke up, as I usually do in the middle of the night, and I couldn't get back to sleep, so I'm a little tired. It's now about noon. I've had a couple naps <laughs> since I finally dragged my sorry ass out of bed at 6.30. I've had two naps since then, but I'm still feeling kind of jet-lagged all over again. But here's the good news. My video review on my channel of Barbara Pym's novel, A Glass of Blessings, I think it was last s autumn. Huh? No, I think it was a, a year ago or so. I can't remember when it was. It doesn't matter, but it was picked up and posted on Facebook by the Barbara Pym Society <laughs> overnight. It showed up in my feed because, of course, I follow the Barbara Pym Society, and the Barbara Pym Society said, I just stumbled across this review. I don't know if any of the rest of you members have seen it, but here it is. And then there was a long comments, and all of them were favorable. They liked how I couldn't finish reading my Barbara Pym quotes from the novel without laughing. <laughs> uh, one woman disagreed with the way I described the protagonist character, but in a very gentle way. But people, I have arrived! <laughs> so, I'm speaking somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I don't think that I'm going to get a job out of this or <laughs> there's no check coming in the mail, but still rather nice. I just hope the Barbara Pym Society don't see this video. Stay tuned! I have had a rather disappointing reading month. The month is not over. And I have had some terrific reads. But I have a lot of mediocre reviews to tell you about today. And I'm going to try to be brief because I finished six books. And I also want to balance it. I kind of promised people on Twitter that today's... Friday Reads was going to be ranty, and I'm not sure how ranty it's going to end up being. There were things that I really hated about some of the books, but in those books there was also things that I admired, so I will try to represent all of that fairly, <laughs> but there'll probably be a little bit of ranting, so fasten your seat belts. I have one bail to tell you about, and that was the audiobook that I was doing this month, The Caregiver by Samuel Park. I did 60% of it, and I gave up on it. The first thing I would say is a story that has a kind of bifurcated, staggered, there's two storylines and they're staggered throughout the novel. That usually doesn't work because almost all the time, one of the stories is really interesting and the other one's not. And that's what happened. That was one of the things that happened here. So the more present part of the story was the Brazilian protagonist, a young woman, she's in California and she's a caregiver kind of home hospice type worker taking care of a, a rich woman who's dying. There was nothing about that part of the story that was at all interesting. But very quickly it went back to her childhood in Brazil, in, um, I think it was Rio de Janeiro. And that story was started out really interesting. Her mother was a voice actor doing dubbing for the, the Hollywood movies and doing the voices of the acting. And then she gets mixed up with uh, a rebel group and in a way to try to ensnare the police chief. And it's a very dramatic and very well told. And that was a good hundred pages of audio, you know, or several hours of audio. And I was quite gripped by that. But then it started going back to the present story and it wasn't any more interesting than it had been hundreds of pages before. And... Then the Brazilian earlier story advanced a year or two, or, or a few years. So I think the uh, the young girl, she was about eight years old for that dramatic thing, and then she's 17 years old, still in Rio de Janeiro. And she t gets involved in something to do with her mother and the police chief several years later, and ends up meeting the police chief's son under false pretenses. And I got 
I wanted to puke when I realized what was going to happen, and I didn't even tr turn the turn the audio page to find out what kind of plot they were going to hatch. The police chief's son, who was her mother's torturer, and this girl, and it's just like that's it's just madcap, ridiculous crap. No. Also, this novel suffered, and there was things that I admired about it. But one of the things that was maybe typical first novel problem is no, not only first novel. I hate it when they put a child character in the most un unlikeliest of places just so she can be the, the w witness to the events of the story. I remember that bugged me just a little bit with Elizabeth Gaskell's Wives and Daughters during Victober, but here it would really bug me because it was just improbable that this mother would take her eight-year-old daughter around when she's helping the rebels and, the, and you know, never mind how does that get rendered in narrative? Is it really through the consciousness of an eight-year-old or is it her adult self? That aside, it was just ridiculous that she would be witnessing all this stuff. So no, it was, it was no good. But I finished a swack of books. Like I said, I have finished six. And I have a lot to say about all of them and I've already been going on for seven minutes. So these are going to be quick. I both started and finished this book this week, Such Small Hands by Andrus Barba. This was a buddy read uh, with Sharon of Hooked on Books, our first buddy read, and I hope not our last. We did it over three days, and the novella was divided into three, three chapters or three sections. And first of all, I'm going to point you to Sharon's wonderful review. It's, as, a, as a work of video, it's brilliant, and so is her review. So I should just say go listen to what she said because we agree completely about this novel. This was a five-star read for me. My only five-star read this week. I didn't think I was going to like it. I'm surprised that I loved it, but I absolutely did. Translated from the Spanish by Lisa Dillman with an afterword by Edmund White. So it's about a young girl whose parents are killed in a car accident and she goes to an orphanage and all of the other orphans have been there since they were babies or for years anyway and she's the newbie and it doesn't go well. That's all I need to say about the plot, but what this really is beyond that is a really profound, psychologically compelling exploration of identity and difference. And when I hear those things, when people talk about those things as being the themes of literature, my eyes glaze over. But here, it really works. The writing slash translation is gorgeous. And it's one of the truest books about childhood I think I've ever read. It's a little bit dark. It's based on a really dark true story. The novelist went a different direction with the novel, which is great. And it, so it does contain some dark plot twists, but it's not a horror movie, not a horror story by any means. I was just blown away. This is a book that I, I really do plan to reread sooner rather than later because it was just rich. There's a, a particularly fabulous scene where the girl she dismembers or she cuts up a, a live caterpillar and the way that gets interpolated with her s grief counseling sessions and the circle of children watching her do it and the way that that is all woven together it was a breathtakingly exciting passage and it, it, it's worth the price of the book just for those couple pages loved it i have so much to say about this that i really may opt to do a full review even though this ended up being a two-star read for me, and I don't usually like to do those kind of full reviews. This was a buddy read with Ollie Bliss, and it was a wonderful buddy read. We, we took the whole month almost to read this, and it started out really strong and had one of the most despicably disappointing endings to a novel that I think I've ever read. Wish the hell I'd bailed. This was almost an extreme bail at the 95% mark because the ending sucked. I should just leave it at that, but it was a gay novel about a white South African, Afrikaner South African, Etienne, who escapes in 1986 during the dying days of apartheid to avoid conscription, ends up in London, has a great sex life, many weird boyfriends, and goes to film school. His boyfriend Axel is becomes the other main character in the story, and I thought long and hard as I was reading it, as, as I've been processing my reaction to it, about the perennial conversation on booktube and among readers everywhere is, does an unlikable 
character mean that the book is no good or that, that you don't like the book because you don't like the characters. In this case, yes. There was other problems with the book. There was some really uh, commendable strengths to the novel. But Axel was one of the most, I can't use despicable twice in this video, hateful characters. I reacted to him as if he was my best friend's boyfriend and reacted to this book with that level of ferocious indignation that the protagonist Etienne kept him around. So I'm just going to say one more thing because, you know, I could go on for hours, but uh, Axel is a pediatric nurse and an artist and his art, one of his art installations, which he gets Etienne to help him make is constructed out of hair that he shaves off the heads of terminally ill children in his hospital in secret late at night and he, he enlists Etienne's help. Now if that, you know, if, if you need to know anything more about a person before you realize what a freaking asshole he is, and, and I had to put up with him through this whole 400 page book. There's a lot of stuff about history and film and I enjoyed so much of it. The ending and tying up of, of all the loose ends at the end was ridiculous. So, two stars. Promising novelist, bad novel. Hateful character. I think I already know who my most hated character for 2019 is going to be. Oof. Much more successfully was this Canadi Western Canadian novel. Boy, look at that glare. Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso, a 1925 novel. Martha Ostenso it was a Norwegian-American-Canadian writer. She lived, she grew up part of her childhood in Winnipeg after being born in Norway in 1900, and this was her first novel. I read this years ago, I think it, for a university course. This was a buddy read, rereading it with Heidi of My Reading Life. And uh, we both really, really liked it. Didn't quite love it. Uh, some trouble with pacing and characterization. And the, by pacing, I mean that this novel should have ended about 75 pages earlier. It just prolonged the ending. We knew what kind of ending might be coming, and it was just needlessly prolonged. And we were really, really ready for it to end when it did, but still thought the ending was, was really powerful. It's about a control freak farmer who uh, keeps his wife and his many children under his thumb in the most dastardly psychological ways. And all of this is witnessed by the live-in boarder, the teacher, the new teacher in town. And, and there's all kinds of drama and intrigue. And for the most part, it was very enjoyable. The characters were richly drawn for the most part, and the writing was gorgeous. Martha Ostenso, actually, there's some debate as to how much this was a collaboration with her lover at the time, later became her husband. And there's interesting information about that in the afterword, but you don't really need to know any of that to just really enjoy this tale of captivity and control and uh, uh, some really sexual scenes, not explicitly sexual, but for a 1925 novel, f uh, portrayals of unapologetically sensuous and uh, dominant female sexuality that was that were those scenes were just a joy to read as were the scenes of the nature writing so yeah i recommend it four stars sadly this was another two star read and i guess i should have known this wasn't going to end up being a sean book despite a really strong start by the cover the cover is a cartoon and this kind of ended up being a cartoon of a novel i was very disappointed with the way it turned out this is a novel about a superannuated <laughs> Suffragette. Matty Simpkins is, maybe she's 60. The story opens in 1928. Suff the suffragette victories were all around World War I, right? Um, although the final stage of the suffragette, uh, they, the women got parody as voters in about 1928-1929, but she was not sure what to do with herself after all that. So what she ends up doing is forming a youth group. I enjoyed how that unfolded. The writing is really good. The characters were vivid. The The way that history is inserted into this fictional world was done with such a light touch, and I went down so many rabbit holes, Googling this and that and the other thing, 
So it's I started out really strong, but then the novel came to its climax as a competition, like a sports day competition between Maddie's left-leaning socialist progressive youth group for girls and her friend, former suffragette but now fascist woman and her fascist league for young women and they have a sports day in the park. And that just dis- devolved into a TV movie for children in terms of there were so many characters and so many plot lines and nothing got fleshed out. And then there is, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but there, Matty has a moral lapse at the height of that competition. And that did not fit her character. It didn't make sense. And it was such a stupid thing to hang a novel on that I was angry from then on and hate read it to the end. Yeah, just an absolute failure for me. I'm definitely in the minority. This is a high rating on Goodreads. I did this, I didn't mention yet, I did this as a buddy read with Britta and Eric, and they had their own reactions, which they they may talk about on their channel, but they didn't agree with me about the things that I, most of the things that I, that made me hate this novel by the end, they didn't share that experience, and that's, that's why the buddy read was so invigorating, but I thought it was ridiculous. Not very ranty at all yet, hey, and I think I'm done. Am I not done? There's one more, but I don't think it's going to be rant. Uh, there's one more negative. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. I also finished Sigrid Unset's novel, The Wreath. This is part one of the Kristen Lavin's Daughter series. And this also came from the 1920s, I believe. 1920. Translated from the Norwe- the Danish, the Norwegian. I actually am not 100% sure. I think it's from the Norwegian, but she had a Danish. She was born in Denmark to a Norwegian father and a Danish mother. It, it uh, literally doesn't directly say. The translator also translated Hans Christian Andersen. Maybe this was written in Danish. Britta will tell us. Anyway, four-star read. I really enjoyed it. I was frustrated at the romantic choices that the protagonists made, but that ultimately didn't detract from it being a, a really, really well-written, well-told story. And I will go on to read the rest of this series. And I thought the characterization was psychologically complex. And again, this was an incisive portrait set in the 14th century Norway uh, of the whore Madonna complex as it, as it uh, manifested itself during that era in that particular place. Most of it was familiar to me, but it was just so well told and the plight of women, the, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, blah, 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 and all the religious stuff. And, you know, there was a lot of priests and stuff in here, and that usually puts me to sleep, it didn't. I just thought it was really a propulsive, compulsively readable novel. It's the first one of the Nobel Women series that I have finished, and I really liked it. I'm looking forward to Britta's video in the next day or so. It is with great sadness that I tell you that I didn't like the Barbara Pym novel that I finished earlier today, The Sweet Dove Died. This is the first of her novels that I've read, and I've been reading them all in sequence that I didn't give five stars to. I gave this one three stars, which means I didn't like it. The Sweet Dove Died was published in 1978, two years before her death. She started writing it in the 60s and then endlessly revised it and near to the end of her life. Got a lot of input on it from her friend Philip Larkin. And I remember reading about that exchange of correspondence with his suggestions of how to improve it when I read the Barbara Pym biography by Hazel Holt sometime last year. But I'm not necessarily sure that Philip Larkin helped her improve it. I don't know. But I didn't like it. Ange and I, this was a buddy read with Ange, and we were both quite disappointed. Now, I, can, I have no criticism about the writing, the structure. It's very well told, a very competent novel. But it was completely devoid of the things that animated all of her other novels. I talked at length about my complicated reaction to her last one before this, Quartet in Autumn, where it was quite dark, but there was enough of that animating energy, especially near the end, that it was still a, an exuberant five-star read for me. But this one, it, it, the character, and again, so here's this theme. This is the theme of my reading this week. The characters were just 
odious. There was an uncle and his nephew. The nephew comes out as gay to the degree that uh, he comes out at all, but he, he starts leading a gay life through the course of the events of the novel. But by that point, he had been taken under the wing of this older woman who's maybe arguably the main character, Leonora, and she's never married, and she's kind of reminiscent of Barbara Pym in many ways, but she kind of adopts him, takes him under her wing, yearns for him, has des- has a complicated older woman, younger man desire, and then resents the boyfriend, and it's just these people, none of the characters, almost none of the characters, had any human connection, and their interiority was rendered in the most selfish, harshly judgmental thoughts that Pym ascribed to all of them, almost all of them, almost on every page, and it just wore me down. This read more like a Muriel Spark novel than a Barbara Pym novel, and I was bitterly disappointed by it. But three of my favorite novels of all time are by Barbara Pym, Mentioned them in a very recent video, but her debut, Some Tame Gazelle, A Glass of Blessings, and No Fond Return of Love. I don't think I could name three books by any other writer that I loved, but you can't win them all. Usually, I only love one book by any one writer, if I love any at all, and the fact that I've gotten three from Barbara. But this one, not very good. Not a Sean book, not at all. So I hope the Barbara Pym Society doesn't see this video. So those were the six books that I finished. And I have started two new books this week. I mentioned this, or had I started it last week? I can't remember. I'm not going to bother to take the time. It's hard for me to remember from one fight to the next. When I featured it last week, was it in my coming up in the next week TBR, or was it in my recently started? I can't remember. But this is Madeline Tien's collection of short stories, her only published collection of short stories, Simple Recipes, published in 2004, I believe. 2001. And I said last week that my working theory is that if you excel at the novel, which I believe Madeline Tien does, you do not, you are likely not to be very good at writing short stories, or vice versa. Might maybe Scolanch's novels are no good, her short stories are masterpieces, etc., etc. I'm happy to say that this one could buck the trend. I've read two stories, and I loved the first one, the title story. I really loved it, and the second one I really liked. So that's as far as I've got, but I have been impressed. And I am using this bookmark that my friend Cecilia, I did a video with her. She gave me this bookmark when we met, when she came to Tokyo. And this is a quote from Madeleine Tien, which resonates with this collection and with most of the fiction I've been reading. Profoundly, the quote is, I like to think of home as a verb, something we keep recreating. And this is from a bookshop in Singapore. And I have started the Queen Mary biography, The Quest for Queen Mary by James Pope Hennessy, edited, really compiled by Hugo Vickers. So the story of this is, I'm absolutely loving it. I'm just like a cocaine addict with a fence. James Pope Hennessy wrote the biography on Queen Mary a few years after her death and got access to all the royals of Europe and this person and that person. And he couldn't publish the juiciest bits, but he kept the notes. And the notes of all the juicy bits that were left out of the 1959 biography or whenever it was written uh, have been compiled in the year 2018 and presented for the first time. And it's delicious! I will have much more to say. I'm just looking at the time when I do a full review of this. I'll be finished it by the end of the month, I hope. Doing this buddy read with Leah of Calgary, and we are geeking out in the royalist way possible. All right, uh, rather than do a long song and dance, because I'm gonna be reading about another four, three or four books in the coming week, I'm just gonna show them to you. They're from my read your shelves, but I'm gonna be vlogging probably daily until the end of the month as I finish up my read your shelves challenge. So, Crudo by Olivia Lang, I will be starting today. Houseboy by Ferdinand Oyono, I will be starting today. And Murakami's South of the Border, West of the Sun. I'm thinking to myself, if I can finish a couple of these or make really substantial progress by the end of the weekend, I'm going to try to sneak in one more book for Read Your Shelves. 
and I will explain why and talk at length on the vlog. And that is this novel from Angola, Transparent City by Onjaki. It's a chunkster, 400 pages, but I've been dying to read it, and if I don't, yeah, check out my vlog for more information. Whew, what a week. Some disappointments, some joy, some very happy experiences, some fantastic buddy reading. Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Uh, then life has its disappointments, don't you agree? Has your week, reading-wise or otherwise, been mostly disappointing or mostly joyful? Tell me all about it in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.